Hello, everyone. My name is Caleb Barden. I use he, she, and they pronouns, and I am a person with lived expertise of homelessness. The concept of lived expertise is not new, but the importance of it is finally being recognized in the housing field. The disability rights movement pioneered the practice of involving people impacted by decisions in the process of decision making. Nothing about us without us was the phrase they made popular, pushing lawmakers and direct service providers to meaningfully involve people with lived expertise. This philosophy has been applied to many different facets of human rights, including our collective approach to addressing homelessness and housing instability. Meaningful engagement results in system and programmatic implementations that are more relevant and responsive. Engaging people with lived expertise is an urgent and necessary matter as communities grapple with how to create more equitable systems. Today, I have three guests with lived expertise who are ready to discuss the importance of communities addressing homelessness, collaborating with, hiring, and sharing power with people impacted by this issue in the process. Since her episode of homelessness, she has worked diligently in her community to advocate for systematic changes that are attributed to hers and others' experiences of homelessness. While filling many seats in her local COC, Keisha immediately recognized the lack of diversity at the tables and how agencies continually invited people to the table without compensation. Since she presented to the HSC Board of Directors and her COC, a proposal to implement a lived experience committee. Let's welcome to Keisha Jordan to discuss that work. Hi. Hi, Keisha. Hi, thank you for having me. I'm so happy to be here. I'm so happy to have you. It really is good to see you. Do you have any ideas or strategies that people should keep in mind when they're working with people with lived expertise? Oh. Uh. It's about wording, I want to say. Um, they have to be careful. Like, I, I think the, the how they approach a situation with a person or, um, I mean, because it could kind of make a person pull up, put up this wall. <laughs> so it's kind of weird, but I really don't have um, any. Yeah. Well, that's really actual, that's really great advice right there. You know, be careful about how you word things, how you approach things. I think that's very sound advice, actually. Because people, you know, one of the things that I oftentimes try to tell people, like, the reality is that we're all people. <laughs> the, part, the first part of it mm -hmm. is, is the, the second hand, right? People first. So, you know, we're, we're, we should be addressed and approached and collaborated with just like everyone else. And you want to be paid for your work and your contributions to society. So, so do yep. we, right? Yep. <laughs> yeah. Yep. And I was also wanted to say, like, some of the ways that I think that a community can do this is by incorporating job descriptions that don't require a person to hold a degree, um, but obviously meet the qualifications of a person with lived experience. But um, and I'm going to say this because I kind of been big on this. Like, for example, um, I have, of course, said many dominant white dominant spaces and listen to how folks um, around the table are making executive decisions about services for folks that, you know, hit, that actually has a platform to uh, apply or utilize the services. Um, and I always thought that, I always felt like some of the ways that they can um, do, some of the ways that they can help in communities is by incorporating job descriptions that don't require a person to um, actually hold a degree, but meet the, again, meet the qualifications and stuff. Um, and I just think that like, who who knows the job better than the person who had to navigate and apply for those resources and to survive day to day. Um, and which also brings me, which I did point out, talked about, you know, also because of mistrust in our systems and stuff. And then also talking about how, you know, um, a personal lived experience can also help to, um, you know, could be the connection, actually, informing uh, positive relationships. So I'm kind of piggybacking on some of your questions. You was moving a little too fast. Oh, so you don't even realize it, but you actually answered the question that I asked. Like that was a that was a strategy that people should absolutely consider when engaging people with lived expertise is remove the 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 degree from the job description. Why does that need to be there, right? Exactly. That why is that exactly. even important? That is a that is yeah, a strategy that everyone should consider. 
Yep, and that's small things like that that can basically help, you know, help make a difference in how services are delivered and actually change the way the homeless system, you know, saying operate. You know, people don't, I mean, it's just that small little thing. Then also, I wanted to, when I'm thinking about strategies and ideas, because again, I always get this question from a lot of tables and uh, that I sit at, and it's like, you know, which is, you know, how do we start? Like, you know, how do we be attentional? You know what I'm saying? So I'm, I'm always getting this question from people like everywhere. And I and, and I really took a, a hard look at this. And then one of the ways that I thought about how, you know, my idea of exploring and looking into this a little more is that first of all, being being intentional, how you are asking, not only when asking people to the table with compensation, but also you can't go get somebody that just moved into housing uh, uh, two weeks ago. You know mm. what I'm saying? Because they still trying to get themselves together and they still trying to, you know what I'm saying? They, you know, just, just got into housing. So I think one of the strategies that I use and the response that I had received in my communities because I was intentional about how I reached out to past clients. I went back, I looked at those that was in housing three years or longer, gave me the greater the greatest response. I actually did, but and I had to do it twice. The first time, that's why I, I noticed it. The first time I did look at that first, like um, like one year, you know what I'm saying? Two people that just got enrolled in programs and stuff. And it was like, the response was like, nah, I got too much going on. I'm still trying to do this, do that. So then that's when I had to come back to the table. And that's what I did. And my response was so great. So anyway, it's just kind of like, I always, you know, kind of tell, that's one advice and one strategy that I would tell people to do three years or longer. You know, I, I'm loving this right now, but I, I want you to hold some of it because I'm going to bring you back at the end. OK, I want you to I want you to stick around for me. And thank you so much for giving your contributions right now. You've been a really, really amazing guest. But again, okay. stick around for us because we're going to bring you back in, in a little bit. All right. OK, don't this way. All right. Thank you, Keisha. <laughs> My next guest is Tiffany Hart. In her day job, she serves as a HUD technical assistant provider, helping communities plan for and think about strategic ways to end homelessness in their communities. By night, she volunteers as a community organizer in her hometown, working to educate, motivate, encourage, and challenge community, mem community members and partners to do the work of uprooting systemic injustices so that all people can have access to safe and stable housing, and we can live in a more liberated world. Working to end homelessness isn't just a job for her. This is her passion and purpose. Let us welcome Tiffany Hart. Hey, Caleb, how are you? Hey, how are you doing? Good, good, glad to be here. It's so good to see you. Do you think that there are any particular considerations around racial disparities that are meaning that are essential to consider whenever you're doing meaningful engagement? Yeah, absolutely. I think recently I've heard a lot of this talk about we need to create seats at the table. We need to make sure that people are represented in seats at the table. And I think that's important. But what I think is even more important is about building that table together, right? Like if we're gonna really incorporate folks with lived expertise, it shouldn't be an afterthought. Um, if we're gonna look at these racial disparities in our systems, because we know they exist, right? We know that um, black, Latinx, indigenous, and other people of color are disproportionately represented in our homeless service systems. And so when we're looking at our COC boards or you're looking at the rooms where decisions are being made, is it all white people? Because if it is, then you have a problem on your hands, right? Like you can't change a problem if you're not the closest person to the problem, right? Yeah. I think um, we need to better understand who's accessing your system and bring those people into the decision-making rooms to build these tables together. Um, I think we have to understand the history of harm and the disparities that we've caused. We have to own up to that and work to change our systems. I think I recently heard someone say this and it stuck with me. An apology without change is just manipulation. And I think a part of that change is accountability in this work. And I think when we're talking about racial disparities in the work and we're talking about like how, community, how can communities um, bring people to the table, um, but also like how can leaders and communities start to change to address their own disparities? Because if there are disparities in your system, then chances are that those policies that created those disparities are racist policies, right? And so I think we have to 
have leaders who are willing to really commit to and unpack their own bias, both conscious and unconscious, um, which means willing to address our own internalized racism, sexism, ableism, right? Um, which kind of leads me to this like thought around intersectionality too, right? Like when you're having people who are making decisions and having people lead, and I think it really requires allowing people with lived expertise to lead the decisions, right? Not just being there to contribute to conversations, but to lead. Um, and so when you're looking at what does our representation look like at these different decision-making tables? Do you have black folks, Latinx folks, or indigenous folks represented at the table? Are there people who identify as members of the LGBTQ plus community? Do you have differently abled people represented? What about different gendered folks or gender fluid folks, right? It's that thing you mentioned in the beginning, Caleb, nothing about us without us. Mm -hmm. And that representation matters. And if communities continue to create programs and services and systems without the experts, and in this case, when I say experts, it's like Keisha said too, it's not the people with the degrees. It's not mm. the people who've worked in the field for a number of years. It's the people who are most impacted and closest to the problem. Then we're going to continue to perpetuate these disparities and uphold these systems of oppression. Mm. Yeah. You said one thing about like, you know, the, you know, how are, would you be able to solve the problem and, and folk the problem is being impacted by on people like black and brown individuals right and so trying to solve that problem without them being a part of creating the solution just doesn't make sense the other part that doesn't make sense to me is that folks who have been a part of creating that problem have oftentimes been in those roles for 20 30 10, 15, however long years, mm -hmm. and they're really convinced that they're going to be able to change the problem that they created themselves. So yeah, so much of this is is like really having to unpack some people feeling like they are ability to, uh, they are able to save or, you know, do what it, they have the correct answers for the yeah. homelessness system, you know? I can, I can sit here and talk to you all day, Tiffany. Please do not go anywhere. Don't go too far. I would love to bring you back. Cool. Thanks, Caleb. Thank you so much for chatting with me. Wow. Courage over comfort. My next guest is Masita Dorley, currently serving as an on-call homelessness service consultant with ICF. Masita has been a professional providing direct and consultancy services for the past 16 years before finding herself living out of the same housing situation she vowed to eliminate within her community. It's because of these dual experiences, both professionally and personally, that she has joined us today to share her thoughts on how to integrate meaningful engagement with those with lived expertise for your specific community planning process. Let us welcome Masita Dorley. Oh, hi. I am so happy to be here. Thank you for that great so introduction. Have you. Yeah. How are you? You know, I know you uh, you look you look well. I'll say well, that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. See you as well. <laughs> There can be a lot of power hoarding and decisions made behind closed doors in the community planning process as well. How can communities ensure that transparency is being built into this process? Start from the beginning, right? Mm. Don't open door policy. It's not just for coordinated entry. <laughs> you know, have an open door policy um, in the fact of, again, to that point, it's really, really important that people are intentional when you are starting a project, when you are strategizing, when you're developing plans that's either citywide, countywide, statewide, that you do do an inventory. And first, the first step is an open engagement. Put it out there. Let's do away with the backroom conversations. I live in the South. There's a lot of that. And I'm sure there's, you know, it's nationwide. But, you know, let's do away with the backroom conversations where you're developing the, the whole uh, process uh, with a few people. And then you're just opening it for, quote unquote, transparency. Uh, because you have to, because it's a requirement, but you've already kind of having your 
mind or within your core group of what that is going to be. So I say, let's first do away with the back back room conversations, have an open, um, open policy engagement period where everyone is invited to the table into onto the table at the same time with the same messaging within the same process don't because i'm lived experience treat me as your equal don't don't quack coddle me don't treat me as i'm fragile you know um because then that also see then that then you're also then putting me in a little box and it's not and know that because of what i went through I, I may be sometimes stronger than a lot of people who may be at the table because, you know, resiliency is sitting, um, sitting amongst you, you know, so, so that's something that really needs to be taken into consideration when, when, um, when you're one, again, having an open process of engagement and allowing everyone at the same time and the uh within the same process that's true meaning of equality and equity right uh, that's true meaning of equality equity comes in when you're then allowing um providing resources so if you're in your community and you know those with lived experience you know the resources that are tangible or not whether it's proximity to meetings or technology and different things like that have um, within your process of, um, of recruitment and invitation, uh, also then try to have your lenses on how does one gain access on all fronts? You know, how does one uh, who may have trouble with technology, how, where can we put it so that's equal access? Um, what about someone who may have trouble with phone? Well, where can we put it? Then they can do it through technology. So different things like that have your lenses on equality um, so then that we're experiencing the same thing uh, at the same time of in being invited to the table and equity, right? Of being able to have resources that we can complete the process. Um, so then that that doesn't um, indirectly exclude us out because sometimes what community don't realize is when they put out the information and the invitation, they do it based on their mindset of what they have access to and not considering the whole population. And so then that automatically indirectly exclude, may exclude a group of people. And then they say, well, we can't find them. Well, you didn't, you know, you didn't kind of consider, do they have a portal of entry to be able to get to your application, to look at it? And then to my um, panelists um, point, to be able to review it and you know and taking out the educational experience which doesn't really need to be on paper um that can be through conversation you know for them to go and then feel comfortable enough to apply for it and let them be judged based on their merit and not on a piece of paper i have several degrees i've not pulled them out of that tube since i walked across the stage <laughs> you know you know i i gained more value in what i lived than what I received in the classroom. So I, um, yeah, so. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. That's the word right there. Yeah. You know, you know um, that, that actually kind of raises a point around this whole concept because people who um, have lived expertise oftentimes don't have access to degrees. Mm -hmm. And this whole notion that they should not be employable because they don't have a degree in the crisis and homelessness response system is just completely bogus to me. What do you, mm -hmm. what, what are some of the things that communities need to do to make sure that people with lived expertise are compensated? And what are some of the ways that you've seen that being successful? Yeah, that's a really great question. And it's a question that is really needed and every community needs to be able to have this as a part of their strategy and planning process when they are thinking, uh, thinking about team development. Um, one, realize that, I tell you again, uh, realize that 20, you know, I've been in this industry for 20 years, but my three years of going through this process has has usurped those 20 years of professionalism. You know, it has just, it's really threw me for a loop. And I think that when communities are um, thinking of someone 
uh, with a lived experience and wanting to bring them to the table, compensation is a big thing that they should, uh, they sh definitely should consider. And first, they're um, in three different ways. The first uh, ways is just ensuring that there's consideration, right? Again, making sure that when you are providing, um, and I think one of my panelists mentioned job description, that there's consideration for universal language and not exclusive language. Um, and so then that, again, uh, people who are able to feel confident that, you know what, I do have an opportunity, I can bring something to the table, and I'm going to apply for it, right? Um, if you're inviting someone to become a part of a committee, you know, have tangible actions. Um, making sure that there's financial compensation. There are always little small dollars that can be found within the COC planning dollars or within small government um, un unrestricted funds or something like that. Within church, you know, I live by my faith. And so you can go and recruit your churches, your local churches, to be able to help compensate someone. Realize that my experience is just as valuable as someone who has a college education. And because if I'm, if you're asking me to sit on a board, know then that my fellow board members are being compensated because they're employed. I'm self-employed because my, my experience commended me to be that, you know, and be an advocate um, for that. And so I would, I would then really would like to be compensated for that. So, you know, there are just creative ways um, to to work around that, and all it takes is time, and 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 that's something that should be intentional. And if you take that time, then it shows through your efforts that you value that person more than just for what they represent. You value them because of the impact that you are confident that they can make being at the table. And then the third way I think that they should also, you know, just be intentional is an acknowledgement. Don't hide me behind the process, behind closed doors, you know, to get my verbiage, to get my knowledge. But then when it's all said and done and the project has gone forth, the name recognition is not there with the others. I think sometimes that's a devaluing of who that person is and what they have brought to the table. So if communities can be considerate of the resources and how they put out invitations, if they can have tangible access of financial of uh, financial uh, compensation as well as uh, strategic partners to um, find those resources for financial compensation and as well as being able to ensure that people at, at, at a, are acknowledged at the same process and the same rate as others. Again, one of the things for me personally, I I am I am proud of my experience, right? But I don't speak for the entire uh, community of, of individuals with lived experience, so don't treat me as such. Just as I, if I'm at the table, I won't speak for the entire African American Black race. I won't speak for the entire um, female race. So it's just in when you are having someone there and when you are bringing them to the table, allow them to lead the pace of the conversation. Let me share at my pace. Let me lead at my pace. I'm just asking you to present me with that same opportunity, but then let me lead and let me share and um, at the pace that I feel um, that is comfortable for me. And um, and acknowledge me again, as I stated, in the same way you was you would do as your coworkers. Sometimes I sometimes when I when I'm in group, I notice you know, uh, and I and I and I don't want to be offended when I say this. It's just that sometimes you know someone will say something, and like everyone will say, "Oh, great! It was so awesome," and it was, but it just felt like it was just a little coddling a little bit versus, you know, kind of then as a reflection of you have to, like, I need that buildup. And I don't, you know, just because I experience homelessness, I'm not, my esteem is not low, you know, so I don't need my, that buildup is actually stronger. It made me stronger because I survive and I'm a survivor. And, um, yeah, and my and through my surviving of my of that journey, you know, I am able to just really just be personable and relatable. 
um, yeah. in the policy planning process and the strategy process. Mm. That's so good, Ms. Ethan. Thank you yeah. so much for this. I actually want to bring back my other guests so we can all just chat for a little bit, if you don't mind. Hey, Tiffany. Hey, Hi. Keisha. Welcome back. So I wanted to ask you all, what has been one of your most memorable experiences in working within a community's planning process? Tiffany, you want to jump in first? Sure. Um, I think for me, um, it was probably when I was a part of the 100 Day Challenge to End Youth Homelessness here in Austin. It was the first time in my life that I really owned my experiences of homelessness and housing instability. Little did I know that it would happen later in the later after that experience as well. But I think just like feeling like I was really seen and heard and valued. I think the way that the leaders just came together and they wanted to hear from us. They wanted to hear like, what are the things that you need? What aren't, what isn't working? What, what do we need to change? And I think through that process, the youth action board here in Austin um, was formed, which is really cool because now I'm no longer a part of it, but now they're making like really true systemic changes in youth homelessness in Austin. So it's really cool to like, just see the journey of what it looks like for a community to really authentically engage folks and it not to be tokenism or showy engagement, but be, to be really transformative change. So just quickly, do you all have any thoughts about career paths for folks with lived expertise? I would say for those with lived experience that you are qualified and don't fear in applying and, um, and go for it and realize that uh, your experiences is just as valuable as a piece of paper and no position, no role is to uh, is out of reach, you know, and when you, and what scares you the most is where you need to be. So just go for it. And, um, and, 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 and realize that you went through this because you, you, you are able, something inside of you is resilient enough to survive that can bring value to the process, to this movement of ending homelessness and really eliminating systemic disparity that results in generational poverty. And so mm -hmm. please just step out and just, just realize that if one door closes, keep knocking until you find that door that opens or just create the door and then allow your actions to have people walking in trying to get connected to you. Mm -hmm. yeah. Tell us what you feel like, what are your career paths for the future for people with lived expertise? I think they just need to be bold. You know, don't be afraid. A person at the end of the day can't tell you nothing but yes or no. So be creative when creating resumes. If you don't have that degree or whatever they're asking for, but you do have the experience, I would put on that resume and be creative with it. I, but you know, I had to navigate. I know how to navigate the, um, the child care system because I have three children. I'm a mom and I know that you know, I kind of put out some of the things that you probably had to go through or either, you know, just being bold with it, you know, and I'm saying this because I actually got somebody that just did this and get hired. And I loved yeah. how bold she was. And I was like, that's a very good idea. And she laid out all of her things like I had to navigate housing. And this is this like, you know, I would be a great case manager. And she got a case manager job mm -hmm. with no degree, no nothing. But she used her life experience and skills and she put it in resume format. I thought it was the best thing I ever seen out of get for years, the best thing I have ever it. seen. So I'm saying basically being bold, being creative, and just going for it. Don't be afraid to like, you know, to put it out there like, hey, I may not sit in that classroom for like, you know, four years and read all that stuff, but I can tell you what I did out here at four years on the streets, what right. I had to go through, what I had to navigate, and what I had to, you know, to do. So yeah. you know. Thank you. Hashtag that was so good. Y'all have been absolutely amazing guests today and really made this a rich, valuable conversation. Thank y'all so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you. As communities continue their journey in collectively and individually understanding equity, one of the immediate pivot points is the involvement of people with lived expertise. 
If you are unsure of how to start, ask the people in your community who are impacted by this issue. Pay them for their contributions to creating a better system. Prioritize the development of an equity strategy that will work to dismantle the culture of power and information hoarding. Allow people with lived expertise to paint their vision of the future and support them in making that a reality. Thank you so much for your time. I wish you well. Thank you.